It's time to start. <laughs> Enough of this. All right. <laughs> um, okay, so first, before I start talking about Leibniz, I want to talk about a final paper assignment. Actually, before that, I should say, I've gotten a couple of questions about the metaphysics exercises rating. Um, I just want to emphasize again that, so, I mean, I won't know until I total everyone up and like kind of squint at it and whatever exactly where the grade divisions will be. But um, but last time I taught the course, the lowest A minus was uh, less than half correct. <laughs> so I was like the lowest A minus was 16 total out of that was th because we had 13 metaphysics exercises this time with only 12, but so that's 16 out of 36. So it's less than half. That was the lowest A minus, right? So, uh, and like, uh, they might be a little bit easier. I, I tried to make them easier this time, mostly by getting rid of tricky things I used to have, which like, they used to be like, a lot of options that would be like A and C, <laughs> B, you know. So I got rid of those because those just screwed everyone up. So they, anyway, they may be somewhat easier this time. So the scale might be not quite that extreme, but it's still basically like, you know, if if you're getting a lot of them right, you're probably in good shape. The, and the grades in the metaphysics exercises are going to be similar to the paper grades. It's the same distribution more or less. So, um, and, and uh, except for people who just don't do them, I've rarely seen someone who like did really well in the papers, but then their grade was dragged down because they're not exactly, they're usually correlated. So that's just in case anyone's worrying about, you know, am I failing them? Like if, if you've gotten any correct, you're probably, you're not failing the bottom. So. All right. Um, now about the final paper assignments. Um, okay. I wonder again whether six to eight pages are too long, but I guess it's <laughs> too late to change it now. Anyway, um, you just make the margins wider. Um, uh, let's see. What do I want to say about it? Uh, so the the first thing is to remind you that a uh, week from today, the introductory paragraph and outline are due. Now, I mean, you don't have to use that introductory paragraph or follow that outline in the paper you eventually hand in. In fact, the whole point is like, hopefully to get some feedback on that and, and perhaps change it, right? Like change your plan for the paper. But, um, but anyway, that's due a week from today, March 11th. Um, and uh, you should definitely hand that in um, because if you hand it in and it actually is a paragraph and an outline, it doesn't have to be good at all, <laughs> then that's fine. But if you don't hand it in, uh, uh, it will reduce your final paper grade by a half step. So you should definitely, you know, like at least throw something together and get it in. Um, uh, okay, and then the idea is, and I believe both the TAs said they're gonna uh, do this in regular sections, but you should check with them about how they're doing it. But because some of the sections might be before the time that this, that this is due, so I don't know. But anyway, um, the idea is that like you come to section and you can discuss with the TA and the other students who were there, like get feedback, get ideas to improve the paper. Um, um, I, I used to do this assignment with trying to get written feedback from the TAs really fast. And that turned out like it was hard. And like given the very short amount of time they had to do it, the feedback had to be very like rudimentary <laughs> so um, uh, 
this probably wouldn't work that much better if everyone came to section, but since usually only the people that actually want comments on the paper come, I guess it works better. Anyway, um, all right. Uh, are there questions about that part of the assignment before I discuss the actual assignment? I think it's pretty straightforward. I guess someone asked, how do we know? It says, a, I think it says in the syllabus, approximately one sentence per paragraph. And someone was like, well, how many? How do I know how many paragraphs make a six page page paper? I don't know, guess. I mean, like I said, you don't have to follow that. So like, if you start writing it and you realize it's not gonna fit, you don't have to drink <laughs> um, or vice versa. Um, okay. Um, Right, so this assignment, so this assignment actually is a paper. So you're supposed to argue for something. You're supposed to make a continuous argument for something. <laughs> um, and uh, there are a number of suggested topics. You don't have to write about one of these, although I think almost everyone usually does, but you don't have to. Um, and these topics are are mostly uh, we're all pretty long. So um, that's supposed to be making it easier, not harder. <laughs> right? Like it's not a list of it has a lot of sub questions and whatever. It's not a list of answer all these questions or something like that. It's just kind of like suggestions for different directions you might go thinking about it. Yeah. So the I haven't looked that hard at it, but the assignment instruction says that you can cite outside sources. Yes. But you don't necessarily recommend it. Yeah. Does don't necessarily recommend mean that you recommend not doing it? Because like I have an idea for a thing I really would like to write that I can probably bend to be one of the prompts somehow, but it <laughs> involves citing a lot of other people and also some live notes that you didn't ask us to read. Well, uh, um, that's like, first of all, if you have an idea that you really want to write about, that's great. Like that's, you know, you're over the hardest part of writing undergraduate papers, which is that usually you get to the end of a course and you have to write something whether you want to or not. <laughs> um, so, uh, and yeah, I mean, it sounds like that's fine. I mean, the, the, the only thing to be careful about is like, it, you know, it should be enough about the material we read that it's clearly a paper that's written for this course. Uh, um, so uh, that, you know, that's what I'd worry about there. But, you know, but when I say uh, I don't encourage citing external sources, I, yeah, it's just, it, it, does it mean I discourage it? It it means like, if you know, if you're thinking, oh, I don't know what paper to write. I know I should read a book about live and it will tell me what paper to write. I don't, you know, I don't think that's a great direction to go in. But like, if you happen to already be familiar with something and you want to talk about it, that's, that's fine. Um, uh, if you like, you know, uh, want to use the Wikipedia article or whatever, then okay, use the Wikipedia article, but please cite it. <laughs> um, and similarly with ChatGPT, I don't know if ChatGPT would, I mean, I know it wouldn't write a good paper in response. It would write a paper, you know, and it would be grammatically flawless and that's like actually one of the ways you can tell it's not really written by a student uh, <laughs> but uh but uh it wouldn't be a good paper um you know this is not the kind of thing it's good for uh but nevertheless if you feel like there's something that it's helping you with just like I think, as I, I think, I think I mentioned this when I talked about the syllabus about the, you know, what is my AI policy? Like, if it's something where if a human did that for you, you would have to cite them, then you should, you know, you should cite ChatGPT. If it's something where if a human did it for you, like, can you suggest a book about whatever? You wouldn't have to cite them, then you wouldn't have to cite ChatGPT. That's basically the. Uh, 
Well, <laughs> all right. Um, sorry, I got on that because I was talking about external sources. I'll go back to talking about these topics. Um, right. So I put the, I put all these sub questions there, as it says in the assignment. To number one, suggest various directions for thinking about the topic, and number two, to a lesser extent, but to head off superficial or excessively simple ways of thinking about it. You know, just like to point out, oh, here's some other, here's some complicated possible issues that are related to this. Um, all the topics ask you to use material from at least two of the main authors. Um, uh, I don't particularly encourage trying to use more than two. I mean, it's a short paper, although like it all depends. Sometimes uh, like, uh, you know, you could be writing about Spinoza and Leibniz, but like two sentences about Descartes might make it really clear, right? So, I mean, that's, you know, it's like up to you basically, but but all the, the, the suggested topics are basically like, um, Comparison topics. Um, uh, I don't expect you to use the material from the beginning of the course. I mean, you can if you want. It's not like there's a rule against it, but I think it might be hard. But, you know, especially because you have just fragments of different authors. But um, uh, let's see. What else did I want to say here? Um, oh yeah, the AI policy is, is right here in this assignment as well. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, so it's, the, and as it says, I'll just read what it says here. I think it's worth reading it because sometimes people don't pay attention to what I say, and sometimes they don't pay attention to what's written. So like by doing both, it's more likely that someone will pay attention. Um, so the intent of the paper is to discuss the views or attitude ma attitudes manifested in the reading rather than your own opinions on the topic. And this, like, this is basically, again, I think the alternative is, although it might seem easier, like to write a good paper on, whether Leibniz is right about the world or something like that is really, really hard. Um, let alone about a paper about, you know, does the world exist? <laughs> According to Descartes, it exists, but I don't know. I'm going to prove that it doesn't, right? Like that's super hard to do well. Whereas to um, write about what Descartes means is number one, it's, well, at least, the way we think about things, and we we saw, you know, Spinoza kind of giving a start to the way we think about things. That you know, like it's kind of preliminary. First, you have to figure out what Descartes means before you can decide whether you agree with him or not, right? So, um, right, exactly what Spinoza says about the Bible. <laughs> I just said about Descartes. So. I, which also means that I, you know, I really think the story is more complicated than that, but it's, um, it's nevertheless, it's a good place to start. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to write something original that's like your own thesis that you're arguing for. You are, but it's supposed to be your own thesis that you're arguing for about what the authors mean. So like, think about what I do in class, like every lecture, right? I say, well, what does Descartes mean by this? And then it's really unclear. And I'm like, well, he might mean this, or he might mean that. Like that's, um, there's there's plenty of arguable theses in that area. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I think the comparison also makes it easier, right? Because it's, rather than trying to explain from the ground up what Descartes' system means, you're just trying to narrow on, a, narrow in on like how it's related to Spinoza, let's say. Like, what do they really disagree about here? Um, um, 
So, I mean, to be good, the comparison should be like, it, to be good, it shouldn't be one paper, like a short paper about Descartes and a short paper of Spinoza stuck together, right? It should be something about how Descartes is related to Spinoza. Um, you know, that's these are all things about how to make the paper good. If you like, if your paper doesn't do any of these things, you still won't fail. But <laughs> this is just like advice how to make it good. Um, uh, yeah. So, are there questions about that? Okay. Good. Then I'll go on to talk about what Leibniz. Yay, Leibniz. All right. So, um, what I think Leibniz is my favorite out of the people in this course. He's one of maybe one of my favorite philosophers of all, but um, first name his name was Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, all these German guys are all like this. We just switch these names and have like Wilhelm, Friedrich. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, don't say Leibniz. <laughs> right? There's a rule when two German fowls go a walking, the let's go. two German fowls go a walking, the second one does the talking. <laughs> right? So, like, if if it's E-I, then it's pronounced I. But if it's I-E, it's pronounced E. All right. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, his gates are, oops, I just forgot since I looked at the, <laughs> oh, 16, sorry. 16 plus 6 to 17, 16. So remember, Descartes was 1596 to 1650, and Spinoza is 1632 to 1677. So Descartes died when he was four years old, but um, he was a contemporary of Spinoza, and he actually met Spinoza in, seven, in 1676. Um, um, actually, like, went to Amsterdam specifically to visit them, I believe. Um, his, as usual, I'm not going to say very much about his biography, uh, but, um, I guess one thing that's worth saying is he's a little bit more closely associated with the like university world than Descartes or Spinoza. His father was a university professor. He spent quite a time, quite a bit of time as a student in university, but he didn't teach in a university ever. And almost none of the major figures in this, in philosophy in this period ever taught in a university. Um, Adam Smith, uh, Somewhat later than this, was a university professor, but you know most of the others were not. Um, and you know it's not a coincidence, obviously. Although it's so, I mean, it's partly that the universities were somewhat still in the grip of the Aristotelians, at least early in this period. Um, but I don't think that's the only reason. Like Spinoza was actually offered a uh, teaching position and turned it down. Um, I think maybe uh, like people with interesting ideas felt that that was not a, uh, a welcoming atmosphere, that they wouldn't be able to say whatever they wanted once they were officially teachers which may still be the case now, but <laughs> in any case, um, uh, there, maybe there were, there were better options for supporting yourself then. Well, you could still be a lead driver, right? But like what Descartes and Leibniz both did, rather than live modest lives and be lens grinders, was like hang around nobles. <laughs> and, what? Descartes was a minor noble, wasn't he? It was Leibniz? 
I, I don't think so. I and mean, Descartes, I guess maybe I was some kind of very minor noble, but <laughs> very minor. <laughs> right. Um, um, Leibniz worked for various German nobles and did all kinds of stuff for them, you know, um, diplomacy, uh, mine engineering, <laughs> and, um, library organization, all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, um, and meanwhile, well, and meanwhile, worked on all kinds of things, physics, mathematics, and metaphysics, <laughs> um, among, among many others, I guess. Um, so, I mean, I'll say more in detail about his intellectual development or his philosophical development um, in a moment, because some of the, the reading is about that. Um, I guess the only other thing I want to say uh, here is about the chronology of his works that we're reading. Um, all right. Well, first of all, I'll just meditations. Descartes' meditations were published in sixteen forty one, and. Spinoza's ethics, well, they were published posthumously in 1677. Um, but Leibniz was probably familiar with their contents. Apparently, the manuscript like circulated. Um, and as I said, Leibniz actually you know, met Spinoza in 1676. So I, I think we can guess that Leibniz, you know, at least knew something about the contents of the ethics um, before 1677. Um, so, um, so Leibniz himself, so his works, it's kind of like, so he did publish a couple of uh, big books. One is called a Theodicy that he published in 1710. I've still never read that from cover to cover. I should. And, um, he also wrote a kind of response to Locke's essay concerning human understanding called the New Essays on Human Understanding. Um, but, uh, um, but a lot of his most central uh, and interesting ideas were um, were not published in his lifetime and are like scattered in various unpublished things, letters, notes, things he wrote but didn't publish. Um, and in addition, he wrote uh, some journal articles. Now, I guess that was a form that was kind of just starting out. Yeah. So was ethics published after or before the death? It was published, it was, I said it was published posthumously, that means after his death. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. His, 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 his friends published it after his death. He, uh, he didn't want to publish it when he was alive because he, I think, rightly suspected that it would be banned and he would get in trouble for it. <laughs> what year was the Theodicy, did you say? What year was the Theodicy? 1710. So, um, Right, so the, the the main things, I mean, so we're reading from a bunch of, like, therefore the readings from Leibniz, unlike the readings from Spinoza, uh, Descartes and Spinoza, were mostly just like reading one book from one end to the other. The, the readings from Leibniz are like scattered from different things. Um, and um, uh, the main things we're reading from the large or most important things we're reading from are first of all the discourse on metaphysics. Some of the reading for today was from a discourse on metaphysics. So this is some this this is something that wasn't published in his lifetime, um, but it was written around 
Um, but okay, I didn't write down here. It says in the book. I don't know if I should bother to write down like when the specimen of dynamics was published. That was a journal article. It was published in Acta Eruditorum in April 1695. Right. So, um, but we aren't reading most of that. So the, I don't know if I should put it on this list. But anyway, it's part of the reading today. It's best specimen of dynamics. So this was published in 1695. Um, and like probably uh, nowadays, the most famous uh, work by Leibniz is the monadology. Um, so that was, I guess I should put the ones that don't need publication in parentheses or something. That was written around 1714. Right, so it's pretty late in Leibniz's life. So there's there's quite a number of years between this and this. Um, I, uh, again, it wasn't published in his lifetime, and you know the story is more complicated. Like some some things were published not long after he died, and then more things were published, and then more things were published. So depending on like. Uh, you know who you're reading when they talk about Leibniz, they may be talking about like a different uh, body of material. Um, you know, that is when I when you're reading like later people, right? Like when Kant talks about Leibniz, or when Bertrand Russell talks about Leibniz, or whatever. Like you have to try to figure out what they knew about or had access to. Um, uh, but I'm not going to try to sort that out in this course. So, um, um, there's a lot of controversy, I think, continuing controversy about how much Leibniz's views changed in this period, like between here and here. Um, so, uh, I tend to feel like they didn't change that much. Um, that uh, um, makes express them a little bit differently, but it's basically like basically the system of the monadology is already what's going on in the discourse on that. Um, but other people feel differently. And in fact, uh, so Dan Garber, who's one of the editors of this edition, it's easy to show because I cover is falling off. Um, uh, so I actually knew him uh, when I was, I guess I, I still know him. He liked something on Facebook recently. Um, but anyway, <laughs> but I haven't really been in contact with him for years, but I, you know, I knew him when I was at the University of Chicago briefly, and um, and you know, I told him, uh, oh yeah, I'm using you know your collection of philosophical essays, and then I like also mentioned that I feel like um, the you know that the that his ideas don't change very much in this period, and. He, Dan Garber was very uh, disappointed because he said, we put the collection together specifically to try to force people to see how much blindness has changed. Views have changed. <laughs> so, um, so like, how is that possible? Well, I mean, so first of all, generally speaking, philosophers are like not, it's, it's often not easy to tell whether a philosopher's views have changed between one period and another. Um, even if they say something explicit about it, because they're not necessarily reliable witnesses. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, um, like, um, there's a temptation to reinterpret what you said before in terms of what you're saying now. <laughs> um, um, to say that, yeah, this is what I really meant all along. 
Um, but, uh, and I think the problem is especially acute with Leibniz because of what I'm gonna talk about soon, which is Leibniz's views about what textual interpretation is in general, how to do it. That he, you know, um, he, uh, his whole way of approaching other people's books is by way of, uh, well, you know, on the surface, this is wrong, but we, if you interpret it correctly, it will be true. <laughs> so obviously he's gonna do that to himself too. And therefore, uh, you know, I think it's hard to assess the data. I, you know, I think, I, like I said to, to Dan Garber, when we had this conversation, I said, but look, he could have written any sentence in the Discourse of Metaphysics in 1714, and he would have explained to you why it was true, and he agreed, <laughs> right? So, like, like, then the question is, like, what? If we want to wait, interpret Leibniz the way Spinoza would interpret Leibniz, rather than the way Leibniz would interpret Leibniz, <laughs> what should we say about this? Um, okay, anyway, um, so that's, so as I said, I don't see a big development and I'm not going to try to, to explain any, any big development in line of these views. Um, okay, are there questions about Leibniz in general? Why he had so much hair? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think that was just the, it was the fashion. Yeah, such as it was. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, um, okay, so, I mean, we've already, in, in this reading, you've already seen some like important pieces of Linus's metaphysics. And I'll say something about them as they come up, but, um, I'm going to talk about his metaphysical system more after we read part of the monodology. So next time, um, these readings are um, mostly about what I was just talking about, namely the, his Leibniz's relation to history and to textual interpretation, right? Or to authority in philosophy, you might also say. Right, so this, as you know, um, um, I tried to bring out that Descartes and Spinoza are both thinking about that, and Leibniz is thinking about that too, and he's, but he's thinking something different. Um, so, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the course that that one thing that all these rationalists and the empiricists all have in common is that they're anti-Aristotelian. They're no longer Aristotelians. Um, and um, Leibniz is no exception to that. I mean, he's certainly not an Aristotelian. In fact, like if you wanted to connect him to an ancient author, he's he sees himself as, and I think is um, more a Platonist than Aristotelian. I mean, maybe more a Neoplatonist than a Platonist Platonist, right? So, um, um, but. Uh, but he, nevertheless, he he rethinks the question of um, why and in what sense should we be anti-Aristotle? What was wrong with Aristotelianism, and what's going to be right with the new philosophy? Um, now, I mean, it's partly due to his. Well, I don't even know if I can say that. I'm not sure exactly what Descartes read at school, and, but anyway, I but it anyway it's it's partly due to Leibniz's background and let's say the way he reacted to his background. Um, so um, 
the beginning of the new system of nature. New system of nature was also 1695, I believe. Yeah, the journal article published in 1695. Um, at the beginning of new system of nature, there's this little like um, capsule autobiography. In the beginning, when I had freed, so this is on page 139. It's like the third paragraph. What? Is that meant to sound like the Bible? Freed myself from the yoke of Aristotle? In the beginning. Oh, in the beginning? Uh, I doubt it, but... Um, so wait, this was in French... I have to go back and look at what it says in French and how you would think the Bible starts in French. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. Anyway, um, but I don't, it's an interesting thought, but I don't see anything to do with it. Well, he does talk about the void. <laughs> I don't know, maybe there's something there. He's been very dramatic when giving on story. Like, I wouldn't have said that my life, the start of my life was the beginning. I mean, so like what he means in context is um, um, like at the beginning of this period when I first freed myself from the yoke of Aristotle, right? I, but um, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, you'd have to look at the original and and it might be a case where you have to know French well enough to know. It does sound a little bit weird in English, like whether what he says in French sounds a little bit weird or whether it's the normal way you would say it. And of course, you would have to know 17th century French. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. But uh, in the beginning, when I had freed myself from the yoke of Aristotle, I accepted the void and atoms, for they best satisfy the imagination. Um, right, so the, the yoke of Aristotle means he was educated as an Aristotelian, right? He was educated basically by late scholastics. Um, although elsewhere he says, he, he mentions having read a lot of Plotinus when he was young. Um, so this is probably an oversimplified story. Um, but in any case, right, he was brought up to be a good Aristotelian, um, but at some point he rebelled against it. He freed himself from the yoke of Aristotle and he adopted the modern philosophy. So, um, which he describes here in, in this paragraph, I mean, um, a little bit farther up, maybe he describes it in more general terms, but here he describes it as accepting the void and atoms. So th that's this is not exactly Cartesianism, right? Like, because Descartes doesn't believe in a vacuum. Or Descartes only believes in a vacuum, but one way or another, it's not a void and atoms, right? It's like the void and atom is, is what the ancient atomists believed in, that there's little pieces that are atoms. They're indivisible little bodies, and the only other thing is empty space. I don't know why I'm drawing these little boxes. These are the these are the these are the atoms. All right. Um, so uh, um, so this is a version of it's some version of mechanism that isn't quite Descartes' version. Uh, I guess he's saying that that's what he first accepted. Um, uh, you know, I know this was when he was pretty young. All of this happened. I think he says elsewhere that this happened when he was like 17 or something. <laughs> so that like it's not reflected in his written works exactly what he first believed. But here he says it was some kind of atomism. And the, the thing is, ancient atomism was basically a form of mechanism. It was they they also thought that the only real properties that are really in bodies are shape, size, motion, 
etc. Right? Um, that is, um, the moderns like Galileo and Descartes uh, uh, and Locke in in being mechanists were understood that they were partly revive like reviving this older non Aristotelian ancient school of atomism. Right, and the atomists also thought that the way bodies act on each other is by pushing. Um, so he's saying that he adopted a kind of modern mechanistic mathematical philosophy in which all you needed to explain what happens in the world is extended substances, and they act on each other by the way extended substances um, by their nature, act on each other, namely by pushing each other out of the way. Um, but then he says, um, but on recovering from that, after much reflection, I perceive that it is impossible to find the principles of a true unity in matter alone or in what is only passive, since everything in it is only a collection of aggregation of parts to infinity. And then skipping a little bit, hence it was necessary to restore and as it were to rehabilitate the substantial forms which are in such disrepute today but in a way that would render them intelligible and separate the use one should make of them from the abuse that has been made of them. Right, so substantial form. So he's talking about um, the form of Aristotelianism we saw in Avicenna and Thomas Aquinas, right? Where, where substantial forms are not directly sensible. Right, so if you have fire, Um, you know, this is its substantial form. This is the prime matter. <laughs> this is the substantial form of fire. Um, but when you sense fire, you're you're sensing its accident of heat, for example. And the accident of heat, remember, this was the difference between the uh, um, Porphyry's view and the view of Avicenna and Thomas Aquinas. Porphyry said, in fire, there's actually the quality of heat, not as an accident, but as part of its essence, right? But Avicenna said that, you know, these these views are all impossible and very false. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 uh, like uh, something that's an accident in one place can never be part of a substance another time. Everything is either a substance or an accident. So the heat can't be part of the form of the fire, but it's caused by the form of the fire. Um, and what is the form of the fire? Well, we, we, we don't really know. I mean, that's more explicit in Thomas than it is in Avicenna, but it's basically like, what we know about it is only that it's something that by nature causes certain sensible accidents. Right? So that's why Thomas says, like, we have to use the sensible quality in place of the true differentia. The true differentia is some feature of this substantial form. But since we don't know that and can't know it, we use the sensible effect of it in its place. And so that's how St. Thomas explains why Aristotle says that heat is a differentia of fire. Right? According to Thomas, what he means is like whatever nonsensible uh, characteristic it is of fire that causes heat is a differentia of fire. Um, and these substantial forms were in disrepute. Well, why were they dis in disrepute? And so, I mean, different reasons, depending on whether you're an empiricist or a rationalist. But the reason they're in disrepute among the rationalists is that they're occult. I mean, so occult literally means like they're hidden, right? And but Thomas uses that exact word when he talks about them. They're, we don't, they're, they're hidden. Um, but what's wrong with, um, thinking of the uh, of 
one substance being a different kind from another substance because of its hidden nature, its hidden character, which we don't know what it is, but we know it causes this. Well, the whole rationalist way of thinking of talk about causation is that um, you don't, when you say A causes B, you don't know what you're talking about unless you can derive B from A. Right, you have to be able to understand why B requires A. As Spinoza puts it, B can only be conceived through A. Um, um, so when you say something, I don't know what, makes fire what it is, and that thing causes heat, you're admitting that you don't know what you're talking about. Um, so occult qualities are supposed to be nonsense. Um, now, I mean, Leibniz doesn't disagree with that if you are using it the way the Aristotelians use it, right? That is, he says, these substantial forms can be abused. Um, so he doesn't disagree with it if you're using it the way the Aristotelians use it, or if you're using it the way he suspects the Newtonians are trying to use it. Right? That is, the, his criticism of Newton's theory of universal gravitation is precisely that gravitation is an occult force. Or, or an occult quality of matter, right? There's no way of seeing logically why, as opposed to, at least according to all these people, you know, until you get to Hume, <laughs> uh, uh, you can see why when one body moves into the space of another body, this body has to move over. Because the nature of bodies is to take up space and exclude other bodies from that space. But try to explain why these two bodies that aren't touching each other at all, that are really far away, this one starts to move towards that one. There's no explaining, right? <laughs> um, so, um, and so in the Leibniz Clark correspondence, I mean, like if we, if we were reading that series, they would see a lot about this. But even a little piece I asked you to read, um, and Clark is speaking for Newton. I probably should have said something about the, about what that correspondence is and whatever last time. It's basically a correspondence between Locke and Newton. I mean, Leibniz and Newton. Um, and uh, but Newton didn't want to communicate directly with Leibniz. Remember, they hated each other because, especially Newton hated Leibniz because Newton thought that Leibniz had stolen the calculus from him and published it first. <laughs> um, I, I, as far as I know, that's really not true, but that's what Newton thought. So, um, um, so you know, but there, but but Clark correspond Clark, who was like a follower of Newton, corresponded with Leibniz, and. I think um, it's known now that, like, I mean, they found drafts of parts of Clark's letters in Newton's hand. So at least part of it was literally written by Newton. Right. So, um, right, so in that, in that correspondence, um, you know, you see Leibniz giving it as an example of a miracle of the highest sort, that one body would move in another, in a circle around another body in a vacuum. It's a miracle of the highest sort because no property of body can explain this. So it's beyond the power of created things. Oh. All right. So so he doesn't disagree with the um, with the general criticism of the use of occult properties, but he thinks you know there is a use for this idea that there's something in body beyond extension. And 
Um, and like maybe these Aristotelians themselves didn't quite understand what, you know, how to use this, what it was for, but they were on the right track in that respect. Um, right, so that's what he's saying. And again, I'm not going to try to explain in detail how this is supposed to work here because it's um, need to get into all the details of Leibniz's system to explain it. But he, but he is, you know, you can see an argument here to the effect that if you like try to make substances up out of just extension, you'll find that there's no true unities in them. And uh, you can't add up a whole bunch of nothings to get something. Right. So like if you you have a whole bunch of zero extension points and you add them all together, the result still has zero extension. Um, so if you're going to get extended substances, there must be something else in them that's extended. There must be some. Um, like remember Descartes' problem about what's the difference between this body and this body? What is this line? Line is, will say, well, some one nature has to be extend, extended in this body, and a different one has to be extended in this body. So we need substantial forms. We need substances that differ from each other in species. And the difference isn't directly observable, but it's metaphysically necessary to explain the very possibility of, of the situation. Um, Okay, so you can see something more explicit about this in the beginning of the specimen of dynamics. So, I mean, because so far, like, I guess so far, we don't know. Okay, so he says that, that first he was under the yoke of Aristotle, then he adopted the modern philosophy, then he realized that actually there was the modern philosophy was missing something important, and it was something you could actually get from Aristotelianism. Um, but you're uh, like so far from this, you can't tell whether that was just a lucky coincidence or whether there's some method to that. Yeah. When you said there was no like any. Like property of like movements and bodies, or like that. Um, what, what bodies was he talking about? Was he just talking about like, everything that is a body? Yeah, yeah, I mean, right. Descartes says this too about bodies that they don't move on their own. They only move when another. This body will only move if it's pushed by another body. And then wait, how does that get started? <laughs> right. So. Uh, um, that's an, that's another issue that Descartes' view raises, um, and the answer that um, the answer that it starts because the soul pushes the pineal gland is not very satisfactory. <laughs> um, so uh, I mean, I think Spinoza, as usual, does have a kind of answer to that, right? Like there's but it, but as usual, it's it's involves involves an infinite regress, <laughs> right? Like this body moves because of the divine power as expressed in this body. But wait, why is this body moving? Well, because of the divine power as expressed in this body. And isn't that an infinite regress? Yes. <laughs> right. Um, so. Uh, um, Leibniz is um, Leibniz is going to give a different solution, not completely unrelated. It's still still going to involve an infinite series, but a different infinite series. <laughs> um, right. So so what I was saying was like so far you can't tell, and I guess I can erase most of this. 
you can't tell like was it a mistake to just to just like reject to break free of the yoke of Aristotle and just reject it and and start with something else? And was the later correction like um, a return to the correct method, or was it just that you know? Um, so like nowadays, uh, I think you find a lot of people who think of the history of philosophy. Like, how is the history of philosophy relevant to to philosophy? Like, why should we care about it, <laughs> right? And I think um, more or less explicitly, a lot of people now think, well, it's kind of a bag of interesting ideas, <laughs> right? So like, so, you know, suppose we're having an argument and I'm taking a position A and you're taking position B. Well, someone else can like read Leibniz and say, hey, you know, Leibniz said something else about this. Leibniz said C. And now our argument is better, because now we also have C on the table. <laughs> um, and it doesn't really matter, you know, how Leibniz is related to us. Is the right? It's just, I mean, I mean, this could just as well be a like a classical Buddhist Indian philosopher. Um, in fact, like that's why we should expand the canon because we'll get a bigger bag of ideas, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, and I'm saying that not because I'm against expanding the canon, but I'm but 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 I but I am against that way of thinking about why to do it. <laughs> um, right. So, um, and I also well, never mind. I'm not going to get into that now. So. Um, uh so so like one way of understanding what Leibniz says happened here is you know he broke free of the yoke of Aristotle because he's you know it was wrong he didn't like this view so he rejected it and he and he adopted a better view the modern mathematical philosophy Adams and the void but then he realized there was a problem with this and he happened to remember some ideas from here and he looked around in the bag and he said, hey, we could use this one. <laughs> so it was just like, there was nothing wrong with, with rejecting Aristotelianism uh, per se. It just so happened that, you know, actually it wasn't all bad, there was a good idea. But, you know, again, like he could have got that idea. Leibniz actually was interested in, in China and Chinese philosophy. Um, you know, he could have got that idea from the Chinese philosopher and um, and like rather than from Aristotle, and it would have been exactly the same story. So, um, but in the specimen of dynamics at the beginning, he he says more about this issue. So again, he's talking about something similar, right? Whether extension is sufficient to, um, to constitute a substance. Um, and he again gives various arguments, again, using Spinoza's term clonatus to explain like what's missing from bodies as such. He also uses this other term, uses. Con conatus means like, uh, like conor means to try to do something. Basically. That's why they, they translated it as um, uh, Nitor means like, I think it literally means like to rest on something, but it came to mean like kind of pushing means <laughs> something. So nisus is like a push. <laughs> um, so, uh, but as they say in the footnotes here, these are technical terms, and that's why they mostly leave them untranslated. Um, so, right, so he gives an argument in terms of if you only have that subst a substance must have a conatus or nisus, and a, a, a merely extended substance can't have that. But then he says, 
And finally, this view takes both the truth and the doctrines of the ancients into consideration. Just as our age has already saved from scorn Democritus corpuscles, Plato's ideas, and the Stoics' tranquility in light of the most perfect interconnection of things. Right, so at least in, when he talks about Democritus corpuscles and the Stoics' tranquility, Democritus, Democritus is one of the ancient atomists that I was talking about before, right? So he's saying that his mechanism has saved Democritus' corpuscles from uh, scorn, right? That Aristotelians were like, oh, that Democritus was totally wrong. And now, you know, we've saved it from scorn. Um, Stoic, I mean, like Descartes' ethics is basically Stoic. So I, you know, I think maybe he's thinking about that. I'm not sure. Uh, Plato's ideas, He's probably, I don't know exactly who he's thinking about there. Probably contemporary Neoplatonists, but I'm not sure. Anyway. Leibniz also calls Spinoza a Neo-Stoic in um, one of the essays in here called the two seconds of wrath of naturalists. So he might be thinking of Spinoza, you're right. But I mean, I, I didn't get to talk about in detail about the end of the ethics. One of the things that Spinoza does at the end of the ethics is like offer a version of Stoicism. Another thing he does is offer a version of Christianity. Okay. Another thing he does is offer a version of like medieval Arabic Aristotelian views on the afterlife and whatever. And he does them all together in the same <laughs> words and um, and they're all kind of misleading. <laughs> um, so yeah, when he's when he when he's talking about like what the wise person or the sage would do, when Spinoza's talking about that. He's talking about something that's not actually possible, right? Like someone whose mind contained only active ideas. Well, a finite mind can't contain only active ideas. Um, Stoics didn't necessarily believe the perfect sage was possible. Either. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, I don't think they, yeah, I, I mean, Right, we could get lost in trying to figure out this. I, I, I think if they thought it was impossible, they didn't think it was impossible in the same way that Spinoza thought it was impossible. But I, you know, I could be wrong. And also, of course, I don't know how Spinoza interpreted the Stoics. So. Right. So, uh, how did I get to talking about that? Oh, because you were saying maybe he's thinking of Spinoza when he says. I mean, I, I think Descartes would be a much like more straightforward target here. But you're right. Maybe he's thinking of Spinoza. Any case. Um, so now we shall make intelligible the teachings of the peripatetics concerning forms or entelechies. Um, entelechy. So there's this Greek word entelecheia, which is sometimes translated as uh, Sometimes translated as entelechy, <laughs> um, but sometimes translated as like um, act or form or perfection. <laughs> uh, and what's important about it is that Arist it occurs in Aristotle's definition of the soul in the second book of De Anima. So Aristotle says the soul is the first entelechy of a living organized body. Um, um, and at least according to the type of Aristotelians that Leibniz is thinking about, like Thomas Aquinas especially, that basically means that the soul is the substantial form of the body. Um, so, so, so Leibniz uses entelechy and substantial form. Interchangeably here, 
I mean, we'll see when we get to the details of his own system and all metaphysical strictness, that it's what's actually going on here is rather different than what you would think if you're Aristotelian. But um, but anyway, that's why he uses that word, entelechy. Um, and, you know, so Leibniz, so Leibniz is going to say that every, I mean, we already saw this in Spinoza. Um, Leibniz is going to say that every, well, every organized body is living and has a soul. Remember, so remember the definition of, intel, of soul in Aristotle is the first entelechy of a living organized body. So Leibniz is going to say every organized body is, first of all, that every body either, either is organized or has parts that are organized, and all the organized bodies are living and have souls. First intelligence. Right. So here, but so here he's again, he's just taking on the like objection. Why are you bring these substantial forms back, these like stupid occult substantial forms that the Aristotelians believed in? Right. So he says, um, so he says, just as these like ideas of the atomists and the Stoics and Platonists have been like saved from scorn. So now we shall make intelligible the teachings of the peripatetics concerning forms or entelechies, <coughs> notions which seemed enigmatic for good reason and were scarcely perceived by their own authors in the proper way. Um, Well, I'm not going to say anything. All right. Um, but what I will say about it is that so far we still can't exactly tell why we're doing this, right? Like, again, is it that we have like a big bag of ideas and some of them have been unfairly scorned, but they're actually usable and we have to like look through and find them and rescue them from scorn because they're useful? Um, but I think the next sentence puts it in a different light. Furthermore, we think that it is necessary not to destroy this philosophy accepted for so many centuries, but to explain it in such a way that it can be rendered self-consistent where this is possible, and further to illuminate it and augment it with new truths. Right, so with that sentence, I think he's declaring that he does not agree with Descartes and Spinoza about how we should relate to authoritative or traditional texts. This is, this is, um, this tradition that lasted through so many centuries, uh, it's the wrong thing to do to show how it's all wrong and destroy it. Instead, we should try to find a way to interpret it so that it contains something true. Now, right, I mean, this is almost like directly opposed to what we saw Spinoza saying about interpretation of the Bible in the theological political treatise. It reminds me of Maimonides. If it's wrong, keep coming up with different ways to read it until it's right. Right, that's why I said it's directly opposed to Spinoza yeah. in that passage, because I mean, like, uh, you know, Maimonides, as I kept saying, is is pretty complicated. And like, I wouldn't want to say what Maimonides really thinks about this, but yeah, the you know, the way Maimonides is used as a representative of that in Spinoza, Leibniz seems to now be taking that side. So why? So he says, um, this plan of study seems to me the one best suited for both judiciousness in teaching and for the benefit of students. Now from that alone, it might seem like the problem is uh, a kind of PR problem. And like the, the, the continuation in the next sentence still sounds like that to some extent. It prevents us from appearing more eager to destroy than to build. 
right? So like, we don't want to give our students the impression that the best thing to do is to destroy the people who came before you. Uh, I mean, you could understand that in a self-interested way, right? Like, you won't want to give our students that impression because the first thing they're going to do out is go is first thing they're going to do is go out and destroy us. <laughs> um, uh, but um, or you could understand that in a in a like um, less self interested way as um, this is just gonna and I think when he goes on in the paragraph it becomes clear that he's thinking something more like this. This is like um, not going to lead to a to a healthy development of philosophy. Um, so because so here's the next thing, and it prevents the arrogance of bold minds from throwing us daily in our uncertainty into perpetually changing our views. And so that I think definitely is a, a dig directly at Descartes, right? The arrogance of bold minds. That who 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 does that make you think of? Descartes. <laughs> and what is he saying about Descartes? I mean, um, it's not that he disagrees with Descartes that there's only one truth in a certain matter and we should try to find it. Um, right in the in the uh, beginning of the new system. He said, and this is similar to something Descartes says in the uh, at the beginning of the discourse, um, that he's publishing this because he's hoping that um, he'll receive instruction from others who read it. And he says, which I shall always be glad to receive, provided that it contains the love of truth rather than a passion for preconceived opinions. Right, so like he agrees with Descartes that um, that uh, you shouldn't just try to defend your preconceived opinion. There's one truth, and you should try to find it. But um, but he seems to disagree with Descartes about this. Uh, Is a city best if it's built by one person? <laughs> and if so, why? And why don't we tear down our cities and rebuild them from scratch according to a better plan? Like, what would be bad about that? And I mean, so like, Descartes agrees that that would literally be bad literally tearing down our cities and rebuilding them from scratch. And I suggested at least that, you know, that that's um, not just because it would be a lot of trouble to go through to do that, but because we don't want to give someone that kind of power. So I think you know, whether that's right or not as an interpretation of Descartes, I, I think Leibniz agrees with me <laughs> on that interpretation of Descartes. But what he's saying here is, but it's not true that that's, that um, there's no such problem in the realm of theory. Um, it's still true here that it's, that a system built by one person after tearing down all the old systems and starting from scratch is not better because um, a single mind shouldn't have that much power. <laughs> it will be bad for students because it, um, that is for everyone who comes afterwards because it, um, that bold mind has had too much power over them. Yeah. Uh, the extent that like Descartes was like trying to do, I was, you know, 
I guess during the like the foundation of his his model, kind of get rid of false beliefs that he probably had gotten through the peer system. So, what does uh, my think we should do to like get rid of those things? False beliefs, just not like carried out. Well, uh, um. It's true. Right. right. So uh, let's. I wasn't going to go to this right away, but um, but I will since she asked that question. So discourse and metaphysics sections twenty six and twenty seven. Uh, that is on page fifty eight to fifty nine. Yeah, I don't know why they. Yeah, there's a lot of weird things about this book. What <laughs> I guess but one weird thing about this book is that, I mean, yeah, one one thing that makes it hard to understand why there's these big numbers and big titles and stuff is that I know they didn't have enough space for everything they wanted to put in, <laughs> and um, and I know that because again I asked Dan Garber I asked him so why are Leibniz's the Leibniz-Clark correspondence is a correspondence between Leibniz and Clark, right? Where they each answer the other point by point. Like, I don't know if people still do this. Like in the days that you'd use that, it would, it would be a flame war. And like the, yeah. the, 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 the messages would get longer and longer yeah, because so. you would respond to every, right? So that's what the Leibniz-Clark correspondence is like. But they only published the Leibniz part of it and not the Clark part. So how can you read that by itself, right? That's why I had to put that, that the Clark part up on canvas. So I asked Dan Garber why, and he said, oh yeah, we wanted to put all of it in, but the publisher said that, you know, it was too long. So then wh why didn't they make the page numbers smaller so they could, fit? I don't know. Anyway, back to- <laughs> It isn't even 400 pages. It would have been fine to put it all in. Whatever. Well, I, you know, pu who knows? publishers have weird things, who knows? Not, a, yeah, some books are longer than others. Based on how well they think it'll sell, <laughs> people are just queuing up to buy the collective Leibniz Leibniz, and then they find out it's what it's five hundred instead of three hundred. They go, oh, I never mind. Okay, I don't know. I'm not trying to defend this. I don't. I don't know what their reasons were. Anyway, back to back to what Leibniz says. So, um, right. So in section twenty six, he explains what is right with the with Plato's theory of recollection. So, or, I mean, I would say, you know, what's right with the theory of recollection that Plato has Socrates expound in the Mino, <laughs> right? But, he, but again, but he's not reading Plato that way. So he's, that's one of the things that makes me say he's more of a Neoplatonist than a Platonist. And I love Neoplatonists, that's good. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, even if I don't think that's the right way to read Plato. So, yeah, right. So, so, you know, so the, so the thought here is that Plato has this big metaphysical system and part of it is the theory of recollection. And the theory of recollection is that, you know, when it seems like we're learning new things in this life, we're actually just remembering what the soul already knew before it was born. Um, and there's a passage in the Mino where there's, um, it's usually taken to be a slave boy, as Leibniz does. Uh, it's actually the Greek word. So they called slaves boy, no matter how old they were, basically. <laughs> right? That is the Greek word meaning boy also means slave. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, not through borrowing, I don't think, from ancient Greek, but because, yeah, that's like, um, I mean, slaves are members of the household that never become, never reach majority, basically. <laughs> So anyway, be that as it may, so like I don't think actually that it's that this that Mino's slave is necessarily a boy, like a like young. But anyway, so Socrates, there's you know, Socrates has 
Nino's slave proved that the 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 I think I drew this little proof for you guys before in this course too. Well, that <laughs> I draw it so poorly, but so much more poorly than Nino's slave. Oh no, I guess Socrates draws it. I don't know. Anyway. The proof that the square on the diagonal is double the square, the original square, right? So like if this one has area one, this one has area two. So it's like on the path to proving the Pythagorean theorem. Um, Socrates gets the slave to, um, by asking leading questions, but nevertheless not telling the slave anything. Um, Socrates gets the slave to establish this result. Um, and then Socrates explains, I was just reminding. Um, uh, you know, and then he tells this story that he says was told to him by certain wise priests and priestesses that, um, that our soul before we're born, and, you know, exists in a different realm, and it, it learns everything when it's there, but then it forgets it when it's born, and we have to be reminded. Like, I mean... Okay, I, I don't want to spend too much time on Mino interpretation here, especially, you know, I could go on forever. I love Amino. I wrote a paper about Amino a long time ago. Um, but um, so, like, it's really actually not clear that Socrates believes the details of that story. They don't, that doesn't really work, right? Because, like, you're, it's supposed to explain how it's possible to learn something. And the answer is it's only by remembering it. But how did you learn it in the past? Like, how did your soul learn it before? <laughs> Right, it just pushes the question back, um, but um, but so Leib but Leibniz also is like doesn't think that you know um, the literal details of this are um, important. He seems to think that maybe maybe Plato believes them, but he thinks they can be like separated from the view, and you'll get a purer version of it. Um, and he says, this is it, like, this, this is right. Everything we learn is some is a piece of knowledge that was already in us. We're not, the part of it that's wrong is we're not literally remembering it. Like we once knew it clearly before, and now we're recovering it. It may be something that we never knew clearly, but it was always there, <laughs> right? And, um, and so like, that's the, that's the correct, um, so even like if we seem to learn something from experience, um, it's really knowledge that we already have. We're just recovering it from inside ourselves. So, I mean, this is like opposed to Aristotelianism because Aristotelians think that in order to learn about the world, you need both the senses and reason and the senses, you know, external objects act on you and, and that's how you learn things. So saying Plato, you know, uh, uh, Plato was right. And therefore Aristotle is wrong. Except then section 27, how our soul can be compared to empty tablets and how our notions come from the senses. <laughs> Right, so section 27 is about how Aristotle is right. <laughs> and he says, um, so what he first says about Aristotle is that agrees better with the popular notions as is Aristotle's way, but Plato goes deeper, right? So he's acknowledging something about Aristotle, namely that Aristotle tries to, um, what common sense, right? Aristotle tries to um, reach conclusions that are congruent with common sense. Uh, I, you know, as I mentioned when I talked about this before, like what the the machinery that goes into getting those conclusions is not common sense, right? But we get something that agrees with common sense in the end. That you know, uh, that was Aristotle's way, but Plato goes deeper. Um, 
But then he says two other things about it. Um, so, first of all, he says um, that um, this kind of Aristotelian view is acceptable in ordinary usage much as we see that those who follow Copernicus do not stop saying that the sun rises and sets, right? So he's saying, like, um, at this point, he seems to be saying that Plato is right, but Aristotle, uh, it's more convenient to speak as if Aristotle were right in a lot of times in ordinary life, right? So it's like, Plato is right, but... Aristotle is useful, <laughs> right? Just as you know, we don't we don't go around saying um, like, "What time will the horizon rise to cover the sun?" Mm -hmm. We say, "What time will the sun set?" Because it really looks like that's what's happening, and it's you know, it's uh, even if even if we all know perfectly well that that's not really what's happening, that really the Earth is spinning and the, you know, whatever, it's still, it's more convenient to talk about it that way. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of like what Descartes says about the senses. Um, I think I didn't get a chance to talk about this in detail when we talked about the sixth meditation. But, you know, Descartes says that as long as you, um, as you realize that the senses are only meant to be useful for like, um, uh, you know, preserving your body and stuff like that, uh, and don't take them as revealing the truth about the world, um, they're, they're perfectly good. That's what Descartes says in the sixth meditation. So, um, so, so that would be similar to this, right? That, like, um, I mean, I hope this isn't too confusing because it, it's true that this, in a way, is compared. This is like rationalism. This is empiricist. Um, but I, I don't mean to, to to match them up that way. But I'm just saying that. It, but it's a matter of like what the status of the less good. Uh, version of the world is compared to the to the right version, right? And since what Descartes says about the, the sensible or imaginative version of the world is that it's the right thing to guide us in our ordinary life. But that uh, if you want to know what the world is really like, it's false and you shouldn't use it. Yeah. So Aristotle is like a placeholder or he's workable, like a uh sense data or like uh, empirical facts are workable and we should we can use them but real truth is you know Plato yeah right but I mean that is that Aristotle's description of how the senses work and how we know things and whatever is usable right that is like so in other words if uh, and we'll see, it gets much worse than this when we actually get into the details of Leibniz's system. But even already, you can see how weird things are, right? Because, like, you know, when I say, uh, when I say, when you ask me, what's, you know, is there anything inside this, uh, whatever this is called here, podium, right? Or anyway, is there anything inside it? And I go, well, I don't know, let me look. Right. What I should say is, I don't know, let me remember. <laughs> right. Let me develop within myself the answer to that question. So Leibniz is saying, no, you don't have to correct the way you speak every day. You know, you can keep talking just like you don't have to stop talking about the sun setting. Uh, but, you know, but if you but if if you want to know the, the metaphysically strict, correct description of what's going on, then you have to be careful and 
Right. Yeah. Does um, Plato being right extend more than just the reminiscence theory, or is he strictly at this point talking about the reminiscence? Well, at this point, he's talking about the reminiscence theory. I no. Does he think Plato was right about other things? Yeah, I think so. I think he likes Plato, but um, but that's not what he's talking about here. But I mean, so so far so good. But then he says, "There's another sense. I even find that they can be given a good sense, a sense according to which they have nothing false in them." Right. So now we get a, a different thing. Plato was right. Aristotle was also right. <laughs> What do you mean? Don't they contradict each other? Well, you have to know how to interpret Aristotle, right? You have to give it a good sense. You have to find the way to interpret it such that what it says is right. <laughs> so that's quite different from this. Um, and um, I think, sure enough, when we see what Leibniz thinks about the senses, it's going to turn out that there's that same disagreement between him and Descartes. That Leibniz thinks, so Descartes thinks the senses, um, the way the senses work is like things that happen in my body are like kind of arbitrarily connected. I mean, he doesn't. He doesn't quite say this explicitly anywhere, but but like why does a certain motion of the pineal gland cause a certain idea in my mind? And the answer is well, like uh, God set it up that way, basically, right? So um, and why did God set it up that way? Well, basically because my mind is supposed to be like directing my body. We're, you know, we're supposed to be working together on something. <laughs> and these are set up in the appropriate way such that like I feel a certain sadness or, or pain in my mind when something is going wrong with my body that makes me want to give the body the direction to, to move, right? So, I mean, it could just as well have been something else, right? It could have been that when I put my hand in a fire, I get the idea of yellow, <laughs> right? But that wouldn't have been useful for the mind-body unity. So, right, so so again, like the, the, the point here is that, and now I think you can see on a deeper level maybe, the point here is that the ideas that come from the senses are the right ones to guide me in using my body, but they have no connection at all to knowing what a body is. Because it could just as well be any other ideas. Whereas Leibniz is going to say that um, what we call sens sensation is confused intellection. I mean, it's so Spinoza already said something more like this. But, um, but what Linus is going to say that, that Spinoza would deny is that we can eventually interpret it correctly. We can eventually clarify it. Right? So that the proper attitude towards the senses is that. Um, they reveal the truth about what's really there only in a confused and obscure way. And the point is to interpret the truth out of them. Yeah. So Khan kind of tries to bring together the empirical and rational, right? Is Leibniz sort of prefiguring that in a way? I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I think Kant is right. What Kant says about Leibniz is that he intellectualized sense, right? So that he's 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 really denying that there is such a thing as 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 a faculty of sense, right? By saying that it's just confused intellection, 
um, Kant is trying to, to bring back the idea that there's two completely different faculties that we need, one passive and the other active and so forth. Um, but it's a good question. Uh, oh, and I'm out of time. So, but I think I said the main things. Um, right, so, so line that says attitudes are interpreting texts is like, although in some sense it's prior to his metaphysical system, in another sense it fits with his metaphysical system. It could even be seen as a consequence of it. All right, I'll see you next time.